I'm Barry Farber. Did you hear about the thunderously big-name celebrity uh, and the stupid guy he meets on the street who went to the fourth grade with him? Uh, keep your radio fix right where it is. We're not going to end there, but I think that's where we'll start. I first heard the story about Bing Crosby. I kind of liked it, the way the comic told it. I, don't, I won't do it as well. But when Bing Crosby was at the zenith of his international success as a singer, uh, this guy ran uh, into him on the street and grabbed Bing, stopped him physically and said, wait a minute, wait a minute, don't tell me, don't tell me, don't tell me. Uh, fourth grade, fourth grade, Crowley, 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 Crosby, Crosby, right? Bing Crosby said, yes. He said, B -b Bing, right? He said, yes. He said, I remember you. You always wanted to be a singer, right? And Bing Crosby said, yes. And the guy said, gee, Bing, whatever happened? <laughs> well, I could, I could play that right now. I could play that right now on that thunderously big name celebrity giggling in the background. I could stop him physically and say, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait, don't tell me. Gotham Health Club, 1957. Gotham Health Club. Uh, That's right. Rexall. Uh, uh, Randall, right? That's right. right. Yeah. Tony Randall. That's right. Yeah, yeah. And you wanted to be an actor. Matter of fact, you got a, a role on stage with, with Cheetah Rivera, right? Gee, Tony, whatever happened. Uh, Marvelous. I never to see worked you. with Cheetah Rivera. Oh, didn't you? No. <laughs> I'm sorry. No, the way that story should be told, and the true story, is when John Garfield was at the very peak of his success. He was having dinner in a restaurant here in New York, and the waitress kept looking at him, and she just kept staring, and finally she snapped her fingers and came over and said, Julie Garfinkel, PS23? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you were in the were working yeah. out lifting weights with me in the Gotham Health right. Club back there in the late 1950s. I'm still doing it. They, Nothing's they, happened. They closed the Gotham. Yeah, but they moved yeah, me yeah, to the Henry yeah, Hudson. Yeah, yeah. They when when the Gotham closed, those with unexpired memberships were trans transferred uh -huh. to the Henry Hudson, and I still go there and I still lift weights almost every day, and nothing has happened. Remember? I haven't gotten any yeah. stronger or any bigger. Nothing. Yeah, you have. Waste of time. No, you've stayed the same. It's been a very elegant, effective same for you. Remember our gym instructor, Frank Light. Frank Light, big husky guy. Great man. Yeah. I write to him. Really? Yes. He was the second Mr. America. He now lives in Richmond, Virginia. Retired policeman. Yeah. You know, they had to change the laws just because of something I pulled one day at the Gotham Health Club. What was that? They had a nap room. Mm -hmm. And I had just come up from North Carolina and I was exhausted. Okay. You know that ugly feeling when you wake up from a nap and the first, you don't know where you are, all you know is you've overslept. Your subconscious, you know by, by how rested you are before you even get up and look around that you have overslept catastrophically. Mm -hmm. The Gotham Health Club was closed. I was doing Peacock Alley of the Waldorf, producing a show for Tex McCurry and Jinx Falkenberg. I had to be there in a necktie, uh, looking nice ten minutes earlier. And I didn't even know where the lights were, where my clothes were. I was just, I just had a sheet around me, and that was all. I was on the fourth floor. I was afraid. It was this cavernous, empty place. And like a blind man, I went fumbling. Finally, I found a light. And then I found some uh, gym clothes. It didn't look too used. Uh, uh, but, but before that, I went downstairs at least the door was open I opened the door from the inside and I a passerby 54th Street very dark I said Psst, sir and he turned around and saw this guy in a sheet and he ran <laughs> he, he ran but they closed they that they changed the bylaws to make sure that anybody gets fired who doesn't look and see if somebody's in the nap room before quitting time <laughs> oh my my, my. <laughs> What was the big role you got? Help me out. I'm not a show business uh, chronicler, but I remember you were. I thought I could have sworn it was. No, Peter about that Rivera. time I was playing Captain's Paradise. No, oh, I know what you're thinking about. Yeah, that was old Captain, and oh, it was Cap Abby Lane. Oh, for crying out loud! Yeah. Don't be angry. Well, so we can settle that out of court. I'm yeah. sure. Abby Lane, That's you right. most beautiful girl who ever was. Just. A Vision. She was so gorgeous. So that that was a major takeoff point. I remember everybody was saying, "How do you like that?" And he comes in here and lifts weights with the rest of us, and up there on stage with Abby Lane every no, night. We talk big, a lot yeah, about you. We talk a lot about you in the locker room. You do. Yeah. <laughs> the big success had been a couple of years earlier. Uh, Broadway success. That was uh, Inherit the Wind. We, we weren't in New York yet no, for that. No. No. Oh my. 1955. Oh, I hate to give all that away. 1955. <laughs> You're a, uh, a keen man with, with, with words. 
I pretend this is a, a trial. Okay. Does the term omaka par mean anything to you? No, it's not a word. O-M-A-K-E, pronounced omaka, par, P-A-R. It's not a real word. Well, yes, it is. It's, it's not a real word in English. No. Uh, it, it, it means uh, odd couple uh, in Swedish. Oh! Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I should have known that par is pair in, yeah, in German. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Celia, our engineer, uh, is your big fan from two continents. Uh, she went to high school in Sweden, where odd couple is uh, still playing wildly away, as it is in other countries. Mm. That syndication never ends. They must recognize... From your it. mouth to God's ear. Yeah. Those checks keep coming in, Barry. <laughs> as long as that syndication continues. And it continues an unlikely play. I, I bet you they'll buy it in communist China. Uh, I bet you one day it'll show in the Soviet Union. It shows everywhere. Uh, people stop me in airports and say, uh, we're from Kuwait. Oh. We saw you last night in Kuwait in The Odd Couple. It's everywhere. I can't believe that uh, an Arab country uh, would show, uh, and uh, how could they? How could they understand? Oh, it's it's dubbed. I know that. I'm yeah. not talking language. I'm talking culture. How could they understand doesn't, those doesn't marvelous things that went on? Doesn't seem to matter. Doesn't seem to matter. It seems to have something universal in it. I think if if two people live together, one of them makes the other a slob. No two are equal, and the less clean of the two is the slob. Or the more clean, or the less filthy of the two, is the neat freak. That's certainly true with children. And it seems to be a universal thing, and it gets ev in every family, it gets on people's nerves that one leaves his things hanging around. Seems to, seems to work. I don't know if I'm a slob or just a carrier. All I know is the phone rings in my room, I can't find it. <laughs> when we get back together after a short business break, uh, I'll grasshopper across several pinnacles of your career uh, and then we're going to settle down to to help a worthy cause yes. and it, I, something tells me it's not the first worthy cause you've ever volunteered to help no oh remind me to tell you we, we can mention names we're grown-ups remind me to tell you what Shelley Winters did when I asked her the question I'm going to ask you first I'm Barry Farber, George Plasco, who I'll be introducing shortly, along with Dorothy Dwyer. Uh, uh, told me during the break when uh, the audience could not hear, but I could, that I wasn't far off the mark when I said the odd couple starring Tony Randall would play. And, of course, Jack Klugman, uh, who was the filthy one. Tony Randall was the neat one. It'd be a broadcasting sin, not to mention if that's the true configuration in, in real life. Uh, <laughs> no, no. Um, uh, the authority I would refer you to is my wife. Uh, I am a slob. I am a real slob. No, a real slob is just sensitive about it, and that's all he does is uh, d d get angry at people who call him a slob. I am a reformed slob. I'm trying to quit. No, I can't I quit. I press my nose, not against the windows of jewelry stores. You know, these stationary stores with the dividers and yeah. the cabinets and yeah, the places. I mean, beautiful. I just like their ads. Yeah. Even. I think all those stacks of things even. Yeah. But no, uh, I leave my dirty socks on the floor. Tony, I don't And I'll wear them with holes in them. Yes, I will. And my wife follows me around and says one word. I've heard this word every day of my marriage, and that's a long time since high school. I've heard this word 50 times every day of my marriage. Mess! 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 <laughs> <laughs> well, once once, once um, I was rearranging some papers on the floor, trying to clean things up, and all of a sudden I, I screamed. I saw some strange blue thing there. It was a rug. Uh, I'd, I'd, I'd forgotten there, that there was a rug. But I still have the dream that one day I am going to quit, that one day I am going to get ahead and then more ahead and more ahead and all of a sudden pop like the last bubble of clutter will be punctured and I will be clean and redeemed. You know, I like to hear you talk. You, without, without realizing it, I suppose, you make poetic images all the time, beautiful metaphors. The last bubble of clutter will be popped. Now that's poetry. By definition, that is poetry. Were you aware, or, or do you just do no. it all, all the time? No, shucks. <laughs> in my, in my, the last not. bubble of clutter. <laughs> wow. I, I wish I could talk that way. 
uh, Tony, when anybody, you've destroyed my Air Force on the ground. Where I come from, if you're from south of Richmond, there's only one way to respond to a compliment of that magnitude by Tony Randall. The proper form, and we have form like the royal family, the proper form uh, in the gush of such a compliment is uh, to blush, lower your gaze to the tops of your shoes, dig your right toe into the dirt, and say shucks. Uh. That, 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 that's the only <laughs> proper posture. You said I... I, I destroyed your air force on the ground. Another figure, yeah. marvelous figures of speech. It, not quite gorgonistic, but good. Yeah. I will treasure that one, too. Anyhow, George, George Plasco said that uh, Odd Couple plays in Poland. Poland. So you are on both sides of the Iron Curtain. Yes, I get, I get a fan mail from Poland. Mm -hmm. The... Uh, one thing I'd like to know, I, I, I don't know if you, I, I, I promise the world that you do not watch uh, assiduously. You don't uh, wait until it's time to, uh, if you're in Des Moines, uh, for Odd Couple to, to come on uh, a non-network station there in syndication. I'm sure you don't. However, I would like to know if when you see Odd Couple, if, if, if it ever happens there, mm -hmm. does it hold? Does it hold? Like a, you, you'll sometimes read an essay you wrote in the eighth grade and you'll say, gee, I'm going to drop this in sulfuric acid and spray it over Death Valley. This is garbage. And then you'll read a love letter from a, about the same period and you'll say, wow, I really knew how to put things then. Uh, which is the, the, uh, the well, case in The Odd Couple? Yes. Uh, first, I, I, I didn't see it in Des Moines, but I did see it in Ames. Uh, I was out in Iowa in this last November in the uh, campaigning for Tom Harkin, who won. Uh, and after a day of campaigning, I went back to the motel and turned on the hot couple. But not in Des Moines. By then, we were in Ames or, or name another town in Iowa. Uh, Fremont? No. Uh, it begins with M. It's Ma Mason City. No. <laughs> <laughs> it's, across, it's across from Illinois. It's right on... Oh, it has a wonderful name. I can't remember it now, but that's where I saw the... Yes, I do turn on the odd couple in, in towns, wherever I am, to see what's on. And mostly I like it. We did 114 shows, I think it was, and about, about 60 of them are good. You uh, had the feeling when you were doing them. Oh, I knew uh, they were good. Yeah. And the other 40-odd I knew were no good and hated them while I was doing them and, hated, and hate them when I see them. They embarrass me. And do you enjoy talking about things you've done? Yeah, why not? Tell me about that, uh, well, I think, was it NBC? Uh, where uh, you played a homosexual and uh, they, the, the floods of protests came in. Yeah. And uh, they changed the character. I mean, they just, they were like a nudist crossing a barbed wire fence. <laughs> <laughs> another of these, <laughs> another of these North Carolina homespun I'm going to shut images. up. I'm going to submit my questions in writing to Tony no, Reynolds. No, no they, uh, none of that happened that you're talking about. Uh, it, it, it was perceived as, as happening or having happened, but none of it happened. I played, uh, I made a movie called Sydney Shore, and then, because it was rather successful, they asked me to make a series of it, and I refused long enough, and then I did it. Now, it was called Love, Sydney. He was a homosexual. Uh, there were some... There were some protests. Uh, there were pro most of the protesting was done before the first script for Love, Sydney was written. Uh, 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 some Bible-beating idiot in the South, uh, no, no offense, Barry, uh, organized a campaign against it. And these floods of protests, as you say, came in. Now, he organized a letter-writing campaign. How many letters would you suppose I got? Uh, from a national or at least a regional letter writing campaign, uh, let me see, I know the South, I know the feeling about homosexuality, I know the tub thumping power of preachers. Mm -hmm. uh, I also have to subtract from that the the huzzah factor. I call it the Wednesday after next factor. People leave the meeting, uh, can't wait to get to the, uh, they're going to yeah. let, but then there's an attrition factor mm -hmm. and they stop off for a pizza or something and by Wednesday after next it's forgotten. So let me just guess that you got about 5,000 letters of protest. I got four. 
Four thousand or four, four letters? Four letters? Four letters. That was the protest. Now, this thing was nationally wow. organized. I've got all four letters. <laughs> uh, I can show them to you. And I answered them. And uh, they never wrote back. Uh, uh, one woman said, uh, the following friends of mine will never watch anything you're on, and she gave me their names and addresses, and I wrote to every one of them, too. Uh, uh, now, this was not only organized by this fellow down in Mississippi, but the moral majority joined in, and the Hasidic Jews, and a large number of gay organizations. They equally objected to it. The gay advocate was, uh, was more critical of this than anything else. Four letters. No, NBC did not change a single thing, and... and uh, Sidney Shore remained homosexual through all 44 episodes we made of Love, Sidney, and in every one of the 44 episodes it was mentioned. And people say they changed the character. They believe all that. And none of that happened. The protest, I always thought that the moral majority and Falwell and company were suborned by NBC to attack us because they got us, I would estimate, $10 million worth of free publicity before the first <laughs> script was written. Oh. Mm. It was a joke. It was a phony. It was a joke. The memory is a very interesting muscle. Yeah. Uh, if, if the FBI called me and said, Barry, is it true that you lifted weights in the same room with Tony Randall in the 1950s? I'd say, uh-huh. They said, we're trying to piece together a dossier on his career. You're a patriotic American, aren't you, Farber? Will, will you testify? I said, sure, I'll be happy to. Just wait a minute. I'll tell you everything I know. Uh, he was on stage in Captain's Paradise with Cheetah Rivera. Rivera. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, I, and I was <laughs> out of sworn Bible deposition because that's the way I remember. Oh, well, I can wow. tell you a lot of stories that along those lines. You've opened up an interesting... Hold it. Hold, hold it. You, hold, we've got hold more important point. things to talk about. Well, all right. Can we make a deal, open covenant, openly arrived at? Will you come back sometime sure. after we make this cause? Yeah. Yes. properly prominent, then we'll finish our agenda yeah. at a later date. Okay, to be continued. First, I'm Barry Farber. Uh, is 15 years uh, uh, too long? <laughs> I should... Uh, too long to let a grudge last. I was just reminded of that old old story. Uh, Abe uh, goes up to Jake and says, Jake, uh, can you lend me $5,000? Jake said, I'm sorry, Abe. Uh, I don't think uh, that uh, friends should lend money uh, to friends. It ruins the friendship. And Abe said, uh, come on, Jake. We were never such good friends. Uh, <laughs> I, I was going to say, it's 15 years too, too long to let a grudge last. Shelley Winters and I were never that good friends. I never met her before that night. I never saw her since, but I'm still quaking at her reaction to what I thought was an innocent question. Uh, we had uh, somebody asked me to do a, a broadcast about uh, a play by Lorraine Hansberry. After Raisin in the Sun, she wrote The Light or the Sign in Sidney Brewstein's Window. And Shelley Winters was very interested in the play, and I go along with worthy causes. I get sucked up the exhaust pipe just like you do. I'm not a Tony Randall, and my series is not in syndication uh, from Warsaw <laughs> to the Wabash. I'm sure Tony gets called upon a lot more than I do. Warsaw to the Wabash. However, <laughs> Master of alliteration as well as imagery. <laughs> well, anyhow, I uh, do get called now and then. Uh, so uh, Shelley Winters was, you know, fighting on the ramparts for this play. So I, I said, of course, I'll, I'll be happy to have her on. Well, show business is not my beat. Um, David Schulte, who sits in with me occasionally, actually asked Sid Bernstein, who brought the Beatles to America, if Mick Jagger was a Beatle. And I knew enough to ridicule David. That, that, but that's about the extent of my entire show business awareness. I, I work all the time. Um, anyhow, uh, I, I, I looked up some Shelley Winters material, I found her biography, and I saw that she belonged. She had given her her name to about 189 worthy causes. And I asked her what I thought was a pussycat question. This is underhand softball. I said, Miss Winter, if you know her, you be the Henry Kissinger, you be the go I'd like to have her on my broadcast again to laugh about this, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, I said, Miss Winters, uh, when uh, an organization calls you and asks you if, if they can use your name uh, for a worthy cause, a ball, a banquet, a petition, a drive, uh, do you check them out? Do you, do you do any questioning? She got livid. She said, what? Are you one of the... Because she thought it was like the old Joe McCarthy thing, mm. and I have here a list. Yes. Of she thought that. Yes. But, I mean, she really went all the way up the wall. She came, uh, she stormed out, and I chased her to the elevator to try to say, but, 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 but I, mean, I, I didn't mean anything. I'm not one of those. I just was, uh, I think it's, a, I thought, and think it was a very legitimate question. Yes, it is. Because I got trapped one time in a cause that uh, sounded great. They were going to educate women how to take pap smears 
by themselves at home. They said, Barry, do you know how many women are dying needless, needlessly of shyness? I said, what, what do you mean, shyness? I said, I know how many women lose a chance to date Barry Farber because of shyness, but that, that's not the same thing as dying, exactly. They said, no, uh, if women went for pap smears to their doctors, they would detect cervical cancer early, and cervical cancer, when detected early, is curable to the degree of 100%. But they don't go. Now, we have a technique developed in Denmark. They can do it at home. A lot more women will do it. A lot more early cervical cancer will be detected. I said, hooray, that's my kind of cause. Barber the lifesaver. And I lent my name to that cause. And I later got a call from a buddy of mine in the Attorney General's office who said, Barry, look, you're not being investigated. We know that you're just uh, a good guy. But that charity was tagged as having spent 95% of every penny raised on itself. Staff, limousines, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. So that's what I meant when I asked Shelley. But she stormed into the elevator saying, who owns this station? Uh, you know, oh like, my. oh yeah, well, all the way. Now, uh, I now, having explained, having detoxified the question, let me ask you, uh, have you ever calculated how many organizations have said, let's call Tony Randall. He's an educated person. He's a super celebrity. He's not just some tacky, flashy star. Look, hey, he's endured for all these decades and he could still play college kid roles. Uh, let's ask Tony if he will spearhead our drive. How many calls have you, if, if you had a dollar for each one to contribute to uh, one well. single charity, how, how rich would it be? <laughs> it's very hard to say no. That's, that's the problem. If I'm not working, and I, these days I don't work as much as I used to, and I have the time, then it's just almost impossible to say no if the cause seems to be a worthy one. Now, I'm the national chairman of the Myasthenia Gravis Foundation, so I'm able to devote most of my efforts to the Myasthenia Gravis. But there are benefits every single day of the week and one could do them every day of the week and I average I suppose two a week but if, if you try to get out of one and say look I, I, I'd make your show but I'm, I'm, uh, I, I'm doing one that night they say look we, you can do both we can figure it out you can do their party and then you skip coffee and you come over to ours it's only across town and they have no hesitation about asking you to do two in one day and that ha these calls come in every single day. But finally, you have to say no, but uh, most of them are worthy. They are worthy. How do you... As worthy as the concert artist skill. Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh, well, hold, hold the line. We're going to save that for dessert, but dessert's coming after one more question. Uh, I call this the war criminal syndrome. I want to know how you handle it. You know, there ought to be an, a West Point for celebrities. I, everybody thinks I'm kidding because I'm a conservative and I don't like government intervention. Think how many lives could be saved if every particularly young celebrity, you know, all of a sudden hit record and everything's happening. Wouldn't it be great if they were forced to cancel everything for a two-week retreat seminar on how to handle wealth, how to handle fame, how, uh, examples, let role models, broken down celebrities who did it wrong come and lecture them, let the successful ones who knew it was only going to last for X period and made mm -hmm. sound investments, let them come. Uh, let those come who messed up their sex lives because they figured their celebrity was an absolute li a hunting license. Go out and take whatever you want to bed with you, whoever. Uh, mm -hmm. It'd be good. Uh, so people figured I, 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 I have uh, fame, therefore I have power, and they went and messed up everything. It'd be great to teach these, let these young people see examples, okay? You, what would we teach them? To you, say no to benefits? No. How do you handle this? The war criminal syndrome. You said yes uh, to the Auxiliary League to provide powdered milk to Albanian babies in Yugoslavia. Uh, how can you say no to us? So you're right away in a situation where if you say yes, you're even, you're okay, your reputation is restored. Yes. But if you can't do it or don't feel like it, then you are a scoundrel in their book because you said yes to somebody I similar. I know it, and you've opened a whole new field, and that is, how do those Albanian babies get into Yugoslavia? Oh, Tony, there is, come on, next time you're on Johnny Carson, stack, I break up dinner parties with this. There are two Albanias, most people, most simple, quick-thinking people only know about one. The That's one, the one I know about. The one there on the map. There is another Albania, just as big and just as populous, inside Yugoslavia. It is called uh, the Kosmet, the region of Kosovo Metohia, and there's also uh, Albanian ethnics living in neighboring Greece. That Albania is just as big in size and has just as many people. So, you know, the Albanian immigration to America is tremendous today, just like Puerto Ricans once were. Albanians are flooding into America, but not a single one is coming from Albania. They're all coming from Yugoslavia. The Yugoslavs want to get rid of them because they're troublemakers. Makers. They're irredentists and they want their own country there. So the Yugoslavs are letting them out and America's letting them in and 
that's a marvelous thing. I, I think I, as a little boy in North Carolina, I always felt keenly aware that we didn't have quite enough Albanians uh, in, this, in, this, in this melting pot. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, uh, is there a way to say, ma has anybody ever understood saying, ma'am, look, you, I am tired, I work, I have my own favorite little uh, yes, Sure, I, I, I do 150 takes, like you no, a takes, year, but not 151. It takes character. I once called up Fred Astaire and asked him uh, to ask him to do a benefit. And before I could say anything, he said, whatever it is, no. Ah, whatever it is, no. That oh, wow. Now Fred, that takes character. Okay, and Fred. maybe you have to be over eighty before uh, you get that much character. It, it, uh, 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 can I get that in the form of a T-shirt? <laughs> whatever it is, no. Picture of Fred Astaire dancing. Keep your radio fix right where it is, because when we reconvene after a medley of selected business announcements, we will pull the tablecloth from atop the parrot's cage and reveal our bird of the moment in its full plumage. The concert. Artist Guild. First, I'm Barry Farber. The other side of the story right now, Dorothy Dwyer doesn't know why I'm congratulating her. She's been congratulated uh, for her circle of friends that adore her because of her works in worthy causes up to, but not limited to, the Concert Artist Guild. She thinks maybe I'm going to congratulate her for her ascendancy in the world of investment banking, uh, or just because of the way she orchestrates her life. I'm congratulating her for all that, but quickly. Uh, I, I, I'm on to higher game. I congratulate Dorothy Dwyer for being the first delivery woman in all my years of broadcasting. Let me tell you what I mean. The syndrome, we, we've heard the Tony Randall side of the story, where the charities call, and uh, even if you have another benefit that night, they try to split the ticket. They think celebrities are made of salt water taffy, and, and there's no such thing as the end of the stretch. You can keep on pulling. I don't care how thin that cord gets in the middle, they're never going to pop. There's always going to be enough celebrity to spread around to everybody who needs one at the moment. From my side of the story, it works like this. The charity comes to me. Uh, and says, uh, uh, would you like to interview our executive director? There's no broadcaster born who's ever liked to interview an executive director. There have been broadcasters who were willing to, broadcasters who knuckled under to pressure to, but there's never been a broadcaster who would be interested in, which is the way they put it, or would like to. So we get smart after a couple months in the business, and we say, don't you have some celebrities who uh, speak for you, who, who represent you? And they say, oh, yes grudgingly. I said, well, let me see your, your letterhead. And always there's a celebrity, not always as big as Tony Randall, but, but, but there are recognizable names up there. And you say, uh, get me him. And they, well, he's, he's kind of hard to get. I said, well, get me him and the executive director. Okay, bring them on together. Let's put some whiskers on this thing. And always, you know, sometimes they even say yes and they don't call me back and say, I don't learn that I've been had until the person who walks in with the executive director is not the celebrity. And oh, with what gushing enthusiasm. They say, Mr. Farber, we tried to reach you. We couldn't. Uh, Herbert, Thunder Celebrity, couldn't make it. But we have here a friend of his who, who has the southernmost brass weather vane in New Hampshire, and he's fascinating. He's fascinating. You never get Tony Randall. When, when I teach at that celebrity, uh, when I teach at a school for broadcasters after retirement, uh, I'm going to, you never get Tony Randall. It's going to be the title of one of my lectures. Dorothy, you are fantastic. This is the first time we ever, first time Tony Randall and I have ever met, and you are the first person who actually delivered the man at the top of your letterhead. So, i got to congratulate you for that. Thank you very much. <laughs> well, you talk a lot, Dorothy. <laughs> I'm just a little girl from Riga, Latvia, which is where I was raised, and that's all I can say. Do they show the odd couple? <laughs> I am sure they do. <laughs> Joy, I'm I'll trying to sit here and be serious, and I'd break up, and you are absolutely unbelievably funny. I can't do it. Well, Dorothy, as I say, is president. She is the mystic mainspring of the Concert Artist Guild. George Plasco is executive director of the Concert Artist Guild. And congratulations, number two. You made Tony Randall say yes. He's going to put on a tuxedo. Uh, he's going to stand up there and be your sparkling toastmaster at the Guild's annual spring gala. Now, at this point in the broadcast, I'm going to lean back uh, and let you all just come in and talk about the Concert Artist Guild. Let's see if we can whip up mass media excitement uh, on behalf of the Concert Artist Guild, or at least let people who should know about you know about you and your work, because there may be good people out there who would like to have... It, it, I consider it a war crime if there's people 
here like you who need support and people out there looking for someone like you to support and radio is too single-minded in its own behalf uh, to take time every once in a while to put you two together. So you just haul off and let them have it. My business associate, Bob Warsley, said to him what the Concert Artist Guild mm -hmm. is, since we're honoring Leontine Price, he said, what I think of the Concert Artists Guild is you are the organization that is going to make the new Leontine Prices. And that's, I agree with that, but I think that George Plasco can do, tell the, about the Concert Artists Guild much better than I can, so I'm going to turn it over to George. Okay, George, just move this little woman a little bit closer to you and uh, tell us more. Well, I won't be as poetic, I think, as you, Barry, or have a gift of words as you do, Tony, but... Uh, I think in a nutshell, what I would like to say about Concert Artists Guild, we have a microcosm right here of why this organization exists. I was fascinated, Barry, by your story and being called Barbara the Lifesaver. <laughs> and Tony Randall, I think the reason why you are here today, and I'd like to give you a title also, Tony Randall, the music lover. And I think this is something that explains about nonprofit organizations. They run, they exist because of people who believe and people who are dedicated and people who will give of their time. I think the story about Fred Astaire saying, whatever it is, no, <laughs> is not the right type of attitude. <laughs> and I think the whole concept has been brought about that altruism is dead is really not true. And today is an example of this. People are here, they are interested in what the Guild does, and in the future, I think, of our country of nonprofit organizations. So altruism is indeed alive. Dorothy Dwyer, our board president, you would never believe that uh, in her real life that she's an executive. She spends, I would say, a good half of her time making sure that Concert Artists Guild is running. Tony Randall, I think you can go back for the last 20 some years, if there was ever one person, I think, that had an image of music that was known, well-known actor, and standing out for music, and talking about it, and appearing at all of these events, I can't think of another person other than Tony Randall. And why do you think do we go after Tony Randall? Because of that. Because of that image, because we knew that he loved music. I think that's the core of it. I sure love good singing, that much is true. <laughs> and I think that's rather important. <coughs> Concert Artists Guild was started 35 years ago, and it was started by a core group of six people, six average citizens in Manhattan, who said, look, you know, these emerging artists that are trying to make a career have not been able to do it. Let's try to help them. All right, hold it. That's, that, that's a good cliffhanger. We'll get back to the modern phase of the Concert Artist Guild when we reconvene. First. There are tickets to the gala, uh, to the Concert Artist Guild Spring Gala, Tony Randall Toastmaster. Now, these tickets are not uh, being uh, brandished on the corner of 5th Avenue and 50th Street uh, by young uniformed men saying, CBS television, free show, 35 minutes from now. Uh, you, they're not begging you to come. They hope you'll come. Uh, the tickets are for a benefit, so uh, fasten your seat belts when you hear the price, but as all worthy causes manage to do, it is tax deductible. So it comes off your income tax on one hand, of course it also comes off your income, but uh, you don't get a chance to meet Tony Randall and the others. And who, Leontine Price. Right, who will be there that night. It will be a magic, I can see these things coming. I can predict, I am the Jimmy the Greek of benefits. I can tell which ones are gonna put your feet to sleep and which ones are gonna have that magic spark that you won't even go to sleep that night peacefully, you'll say, holy man, that was our fun. Gee, that was our once in a lifetime at Tony was so, oh, the magic in there. Oh, can this be happening Yes, to all me? that's going to happen, yeah. folks, <laughs> at the Pierre Hotel on May 1st. <laughs> we have Barry Farber's word for it. <laughs> <laughs> talk, about, talk about having pressure. <laughs> I haven't lied to you yet. No, I, I can see who's going to be there, and I know something of the spirit of the group. Oh, it's so. going to be a good party. There's going to be good food in the Pierre Hotel itself. Such a lovely place to have, a, have an affair. If you'll if you'll overlook the possibilities of a double meaning there, <laughs> and, and dancing and all that, but uh, just to be in the same room with Leontine Price is, uh, to me, a thrill, an enormous thrill. And I think there are enough music lovers in New York who'll pay 150 bucks a, a throw for that, and, and something to eat as well, you know. 
Uh, and maybe a little booze. <laughs> Not to mention to be in the same room with Tony Randall. Ah, oh, well, ah, oh, well. And Nathan Wedeen. Nathan Wedeen is wonderful. Nathan Wedeen is one of the founders of the Concert Artists Guild. We are going to be celebrating our 35th birthday as the Guild, and we are going to be celebrating that day Nathan Wedeen's 90th birthday. Mm. And that to us is a real thrill as well. He's, he's the founder. He's one of the founders. Uh -huh. He's one of the 35 well, well, people that George talked right. about who started the Concert Artists Guild. He's our, execu our executive vice president. All right. Now, let, let me ask a stupid question. By concert artists, you mean performers? Yes. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Because you were telling me, Dorothy, in a private meeting that I was fortunate enough to arrange with you, uh, that you are very fond of composers. Yes, I am. Uh, I think composers are very important as well. The Concert Artists Guild originally was founded to help performers. Uh, we also have a program that helps composers and uh, for instance this year when our com winners of the, our competitions will have each winner will have a composer who will compose something specifically for that winner mm -hmm. to be debuted at Carnegie Recital Hall. That's such a that's such a lovely thing but well, I suppose what many people need to be reminded of is that to become a first-rate serious musician takes so many years of training so much study aside from the character involved and the use of the gift it takes so much money and then then you have to try to find a job it takes a long time for such a career to pay off and uh, these these absolutely selfless ordinary citizens who got together to form the concert artists guild decided to try to help these people and their their record their their track record is fantastic George name the name some of the people they they started well Tony you're absolutely right uh, after 35 years we can really I think boast of a roster of over 550 young emerging talented artists that the guild has sponsored in either debuts concerts recitals or in developing their careers. I mean, you can look at people that I think that are, are certainly household names in the music world. Uh, you have the Shirley Barrett's, the Evelyn Lears, the Martino Royals, uh, some of the younger people, the Carol Winchances, the um, Annie Kavafians, uh, people like this, I think, that, uh, that we have heard of, who have made it, who are performing now. And I think one of the greatest uh, uh, joys uh, for Concert Artists Guild is to see this happen. Uh, Tony, you brought up a point. I think, I, I think as you know, that as, a, uh, as an actor, uh, it's the same thing as a performer, musician. They're that early part when nothing's coming in, you're struggling. Mm -hmm. And it's nice to have a Concert Artists Guild that steps in and says, here, let's help you. Let's launch you and let you go from there. My cousin Gurney always fancied himself a big forest conservationist and all he ever did was throw an occasional rock at a woodpecker. Uh, if you want to fancy yourself as someone fighting to make American culture non-tacky, then there is no better shot you can take, no better move you could make right now than to be present and accounted for. In the presence of Tony Randall, Leontine Price, the Hotel Pierre, May the 1st at the Ball, the Spring Gala of the Concert Artists Guild. Now, we didn't tell them the price. People are going to think we're dancing away from that, George. Let them have it. Well, it's very important because uh, it is important that the support be for the Guild, and it's $150 a ticket. All right, where can people call? we get just got a few seconds. People can call at the Office of Concert Artists Guild. Hurry, and hurry, hurry. If they come, I'll kiss them. Ah, yay, One. that's a commitment. Give the number, give the number. And the number is 333 Five two zero zero. Quickly again. Maybe a little bit more than a kiss. Three 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 five two zero zero. Thank you very much, George and Dorothy, and thank you, Tony Randall. Hey, worth your while, kiddo.